Okay, so now we're going to look at the enantioselective epoxidation reaction um, that Sharpless has presented to us as an asymmetric epoxidation. Mind you that this is something I'd rather want to expose you to um, more than actually have you use a lot. If you have an allylic alcohol, so we're talking about an OH that is at the allylic position in comparison to the double bond, right? You can use terp butyl hydroperoxide in order to use that with a catalyst uh, that contains titanium. And you can use this positive DET. So what this does as a chiral catalyst system or catalytic system, it allows you to add the oxygen to the top of the plane of this paper. So if you've got this double bond in the plane of the paper, what you're basically doing is you're plopping down the oxygen right on top of it. In comparison, we can change the chirality of this type of additive, which is really kind of more like a ligand, that we're going to put in the bottom, so it would go here, the oxygen would go underneath the plane of this paper, so it would go that way, if you can imagine that. And what that does is it's actually going to give you the two different epoxide stereochemistries that are available there. Um, and that's really, really cool when you start thinking about all the things that we make synthetically that need to be stereoselective. Because now we can use these things to maybe be um, a little bit more useful as a drug in an area that could be um, an antioselective in your body, which is very common actually. So this is something that, I, as I said, I just want to make sure you are exposed to more than necessarily we're going to use it too much in synthesis um, because I don't really want you too confused with this just yet. We'll leave that for graduate school, okay? But when it comes to the ring opening of epoxides, this is confusing. And yeah, you probably kind of do need to know this for synthesis. Because you can actually take an epoxide. And this little bit is not confusing at all. We can use add a nucleophile and end up putting a nucleophile right here. And here's how that works. You would just take the nucleophile. He comes in here. Electrons go up. And then this guy comes and grabs a hydrogen from water, and you end up with your um, epoxide broken. Of course, the epoxide strain that is there is quite intense, so it's pretty easy to have the epoxides um, react and, and, and react in this manner. Two things I want to note about that. First of all, did you notice that the oxygen that's here went to the most substituted carbon? Well, the reason for that is because it's got a negative charge to it, right? Well, it wants to go to the carbon that is going to support that negative charge most. In other words, you have the most substituents to support that negative charge. The other thing I want to note is that just like with um, when we use the bromonium ion, the nucleophile has to attack from the back. So that's a backside type of attack. So if you could imagine when the oxygen's in that um, in that triangle. As the, as the nucleophile attacks from the back of it, it's got to move forward. And so you end up with a nucleophile in the OH sort of being an opposite side. So I'll show you that in just a second. Because what we have here is a nucleophile again, ends up looking like this. Um, yes, you can end up with the opposite enantiomer as well, if that is um, a possibility. So these reactions work with a variety of nucleophiles, all of which are listed here. So you can do this with, with um, basic alcohols. Um, CN, SH, you can use a Grignard for this, which is pretty cool, because you could actually make a new carbon-carbon bond this way, or you can just leave out um, and make sure that a hydrogen's attached. So let me show you what those reactions look like. You can see that there's a variety of reactions that can happen here. So again, you can end up with a base, and giving you simply the um, ethylene glycol here, so two oxygens or two alcohols. Um, if you have uh, the basic form of an alcohol here, you end up with an um, either alcohol. Cyano group goes right here. SH or Mercapto group goes right there. CH3MGBR, notice that the, you're actually making another CH3 group over here. And with lithium aluminum hydride or LAH, whatever you want to name that as, you could actually just end up turning that into a hydrogen, which I did not write in because you don't write hydrogens in.
Okay. So that's how we actually open epoxide rings in the presence of a base. So let's look at what happens when you have an acid because you can actually get that to open with an acid as well. And you can get that to open with an acid, whether it be just a regular HX, which will give you an X down here, or with H3O, H3O plus, you could also use um, an alcohol with H plus that would give you OR instead of an OH. So there's a variety of things that you can actually do here to again end up with your nucleophile down there in acidic conditions. Why do we need both acidic and basic conditions? Because sometimes um, part of your molecule is acid or base sensitive, so you need to be able to use it in one direction or the other to, get, to achieve your desired results. Okay, so here we have an epoxide, so let's look at this mechanism. When it goes and reacts with HX, the oxygen will come and grab that hydrogen, electrons fall back to the X, whatever that is. Then it leaves behind a nucleophile that will come in here and bounce out the OH, and you end up with the OH and the X. That's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, good. Um, here we have H3O plus doing the same type of thing because now oxygen is going to come grab that. And notice this is the same thing, so your nucleophile here is just really water. And in this case, when that attacks and these go up, you end up with another positive charge on this oxygen. So another water molecule simply comes and grabs that and does what I refer to as cleaning up the reaction by simply taking off um, the hydrogen here. And you end up with your two OH groups. Okay, so this next part is where things get confusing. And that has to do with select selectivity. Because in reality, you have to realize that we as scientists are really trying to observe our world rather than being able to control it. We can't control the way things react necessarily. I mean, we try to in, in certain ways and get a grasp on what's happening here, what's happening there. Um, but selectivity is something that we observe and then we try to say, hmm, how did that happen? So this is something that we've observed. This is something that does happen. And now we've got to sort of explain how it happens. But simply put, let's say if we use water and H3O+, what we find is that the new water would go over here. Okay, so it's going to go to the primary or the, the position on the carbon that's only attached to one other carbon. This carbon's attached to more stuff, right? But it's kind of seen as a secondary carbon, carbon, not a carbocation, excuse me, it doesn't go through that, because it's attached to two different carbons. Well, in this case we have this one's attached to one carbon, and this one's attached to three carbons, right? In this case, something else is going on because the OH that would be introduced here goes down here instead. Now if this was CL or something like that, if we were using HCL, that means that your CL would be there in this case and there in this case. We are balancing here. What we found is that um, this has to do with a difference in either steric hindrance or electronic effects. And at a certain point, the electronic effects win. Because this would be the steric, this would be the most sterically available position. But electronically, the OH prefers to go, or the nucleophile in this case, would prefer to go to the most substituted carbon here. So it differs depending on what you have as a situation. Here's what it kind of boils down to. If you have a carbon here that's attached to one more carbon versus a carbon here that's attached to two, then your new attack group will end up on the primary. Otherwise, so if you have a primary over here, like one carbon, and here we've got three carbons, or if you have this one even with another substituent where it would be attached to two carbons or three carbons, and you have that attack, then Electronic effects will win. You end up with your new guy on the most substituted. So really, this kind of is the, is the exception. Okay, Don't let that confuse you. Just write it out and say, okay, that's sort of what happens. Okay. 
<clears throat> One thing that is notable here too is how the stereochemistry works in that notice that this R group is back here. We've got this epoxide. After that exchange takes place and the epoxide ring opens, the R group is pushed forward and this guy comes in the back. The reason for that is because, again, once you have that epoxide, your nucleophile has to attack from the back, right? So whatever's in the back gets pushed forward, just like what we saw with an SN2 type of reaction back in Orgo 1. And so that should be something that you're sort of familiar with, and that has to do with that five point, you know, a leaving group is leaving, and you've got something coming in from the back, and that just sort of inverts that symmetry again. Okay. Thiols, I have a particular fondness of sulfur, because that's what I've worked with for a long, long time. This is simply a thiol. Instead of an alcohol, we call it a thiol, so we would name that propane thiol. Um, we could also call an SH a mercapto group, so you might hear it said like that a lot. Um, you can also use this as a nucleophile. They're great nucleophiles, just have an SH, something like that. They'll go undergo SN2 reactions. You don't have to worry about elimination too much because they're not very good bases. Um, so, in particular, what we can use from those is that we can simply take a thiol, add a base, and then add an alkyl halide, and we could end up with, um, with a sulfide, an organic sulfide. Now, I'll warn you right now, these things are stinky, so you got to be careful because you can actually smell yourself out of the lab. That has happened to me before. We had to leave for a while because the lab just stunk way too much to be able to even think straight. So, well, here's what's happening is that that base comes and grabs that hydrogen, electrons go back to the sulfur, and then simply that's your nucleophile that kicks out the eggs. And then that's how you end up with that. Um... This is actually where my PhD work was, in that I'm used to starting with a sulfide, and this is my this is part of my competition, um, in that then we would go to a sulfoxide. By competition, I mean that's just something that I was trying to um, improve upon in different ways, as we do with all science. Okay, so then we go from sulfoxide to sulfone by using hydrogen peroxide. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.